very campaign rally Joe was just talking about in Phoenix. That was in Arizona last night before thousands of supporters where President Trump spoke for over an hour on a number of issues. He threatened a government shutdown over border wall funding for one. And we are building a wall on the southern border, which is absolutely necessary. Now, the obstructionist Democrats would like us not to do it. But believe me, if we have to close down our government, we're building that wall. The president hinted that he might pardon controversial Sheriff Joe Arpaio. Was Sheriff Joe convicted for doing his job? That's what... He should have had a jury, but you know what? I'll make a prediction. I think he's going to be just fine, okay? But I won't do it tonight because I don't want to cause any controversy. Is that okay? But Sheriff Joe can feel good. Sheriff Joe held in criminal contempt uh, for illegally holding undocumented uh, immigrants to this country. It was the media, though, and its coverage of Charlottesville that consumed about the first half of the rally, really. The president defended his initial response to last week's violence and claimed the media mischaracterized the statements he made following the deadly protest. What happened in Charlottesville? strikes at the core of America. And tonight, this entire arena stands united in forceful condemnation of the thugs who perpetrate hatred and violence. But the very dishonest media, those people right up there with all the cameras, they don't report the facts. Just like they don't want to report that I spoke out forcefully against hatred, bigotry, and violence, and strongly condemned the neo-Nazis, the white supremacists, and the KKK. I said everything. I hit them with neo-Nazi. I hit them with everything. I, I got the white supremacists, the neo-Nazi, I got them all in there, let's see. But yeah, KKK, we have KKK. I got them all. So they're having a hard time. So what did they say, right? It should have been sooner. He's a racist. So that's about where the president went off script. He read almost verbatim some of his remarks on Charlottesville off a piece of paper in his pocket, but he left out the controversial claim that, quote, both sides were to blame for the violence there. Here's what the president said the Saturday after the Charlottesville protest, followed by what he said last night. We're closely following the terrible events unfolding in Charlottesville, Virginia. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence on many sides. On many sides. So here's what I said really fast. Here's what I said on Saturday. We're closely following the terrible events unfolding in Charlottesville, Virginia. This is me speaking. We condemn in the strongest possible terms this egregious display of hatred, bigotry, and violence. That's me speaking on Saturday. Right after the event. He, of course, uh, Mark Alpin, um, neglected uh, the, the equivocation where he talked about many sides. But I think we're digging in. You know, we, we can dig in and, and find all the lies, find all of his Stalinist anti-press uh, statements. We can dig through that. He's done it before. He will do it again. Uh, but, uh, but for the purposes of what really seems to be the, uh, the big news coming out of this is this is a president who's going to claims he's going to shut down the government if he can't build his wall. And yesterday evening, the New York Times broke with a story about how Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump are basically in a blood feud. Uh, the, the, they're screaming at each other on the phone. And Donald Trump constantly insulting him. Donald Trump not only going after Jeff Lake and insulting him in his home state, but insulting an American hero, a war hero, who is battling brain cancer right now. 
and actually uh, shows absolutely, uh, absolutely no compassion, no humanity. That may not matter to some of the people that were in the audience last night. It matters to John McCain's colleagues. It matters to Mitch McConnell. And it matters if Donald Trump ever wants to pass legislation through the Senate. And not just about McCain, but about McCain, about Flake, uh, about Mitch McConnell. Um, this, this guy, I don't see how this moved the ball anywhere but backwards uh, for the president and his hopes to get anything done in Congress this fall. Welcome to the heightened discipline and new direction of the John <laughs> Kelly era. You know, the, the chief of staff was there and that event, I think, exceeded the low expectations we talked about on the program yesterday about what he was likely to do, put in a state that, that brings out his worst instincts. If you take what he did last night and how that's going to be received in Washington and by the media, and if you take the New York Times story about Mitch McConnell, yesterday, last night, was a pretty bad moment. For if Donald Trump's goal is to get things done, his anger at the media is partly based on knowing that the base loves it, and it's partly based on concern about both the Russia investigation and his inability to bend Congress to his will. And nothing he did last night that I see, even as a bank shot, makes it more likely that the very difficult legislative problems he faces in just a couple weeks are going to be easier to deal with. Willie Geis, the lack of discipline is just simply extraordinary you just have to stop and think and i was this is going to sound personal i don't mean it to be personal but our children have more discipline than this man has um i i i, I don't i i've never met anybody in politics i've never met anybody in business i've never met anybody in athletics that, that more often did things that hurt themselves uh, just because there was something just on the tip of their tongue or, or on the top of their head. And last night, again, we swore through, and yes, we can be shocked and stunned and deeply saddened. But the bottom line of this is he's, he's going to continue getting nothing done because of this extraordinary narrow casting. He is playing to one third of the electorate and driving two-thirds of the electorate away. Well, it'd be one thing if he were doing this in some constructive fashion, uh, Megan. I mean, he's, the rhetoric is bad enough. We've heard it again. Joe said it's extraordinary. Of course, it's extraordinary for president, but it's not surprising to anybody who's been watching him this long. But as you read through right. this front page piece in the New York Times, He's at war with Mitch McConnell. He's calling Mitch McConnell and berating him uh, while he's on while he's in Bedminster, New Jersey. This is the guy. This is the most important guy in Washington, and therefore the most important guy to President Trump to get his agenda through. And yet he's picking public and private fights with him. It's almost a fundamental miscalculation of what he has to do to get things done. What I think is more surprising is that anyone wrote articles saying he had a presidential speech about Afghanistan, knowing we were likely to go to Arizona and see exactly the kind of performance we saw last night. It's difficult to watch. Let's just, you know, things he says. We hit the KKK. We hit the neo-Nazis. Who talks like that when someone has died at a at a rally by sympathizers with that kind of abhorrent speech who talks like that about this kind of situation it is the president of course children are watching but what was so what was so i think revealing about last night was exactly how unsurprising it was in terms of the tone and in terms of what he said now let's say who, who talks like that but here's another question who cheers at that who cheers when a man speaks derisively about an American war hero who has given his life to the people of Arizona and to the United States of America and did so in a POW camp, is battling brain cancer, is going through chemotherapy, and not only are they derisively uh, going along with Donald Trump's? Uh, but, but, but people are actually shouting uh, that they want John McCain to die. Now, John McCain's a tough guy. Uh, he, he, he can handle that. 
Uh, but Willie, who are these people that that act like they're cheering on a pep rally at a high school basketball game when he's saying some deeply, deeply offensive things about this country and about a lot of people that have given their lives to this country. Yeah, and not much uh, a reference, if any, unless I missed it, to the 10 sailors dead or missing on the USS John McCain. None. You, you thought that might come up in the state of, of Arizona, Steve. But it, was this anything more than, I don't know, therapy or catharsis of some kind for Donald Trump? He seems to be at his happiest and most energized when he's at a rally like this. I think it reminds him of the uh, perhaps rosier campaign days when he was having fun in the job. Was there any point to any of this other than firing up a crowd? Was there anything constructive? Was there anything, as Joe said, he did to move the ball forward for his agenda, for his administration? Yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I think any politician who has a, a winning campaign is going to draw certain lessons from that campaign about strategy in, in the future. And I think the lesson that Donald Trump drew from 2016 was this works. What he did last night works. We're sitting here saying, can you believe what he said about John McCain last night? One of the first things that Donald Trump said as a candidate for president of the United States was, I prefer heroes who weren't captured. Yeah. Right? I, don't, I think you're a hero if you didn't get captured. About John McCain, about two weeks into his campaign. And I remember when he said that, I believe that was July or August of 2015, there were predictions from political experts that this would begin the decline of Donald Trump as a respectable presidential candidate because the Republican establishment would now, he would be off limits to them. And his poll numbers would now collapse and he would fade out by the fall. That was the expectation. Everybody who was supposedly smart in politics told him that. And a few months later, he was the Republican candidate for president. People draw lessons. Politicians draw lessons from what works for them in campaigns. Except, Nick, that was he was trying to win a, a majority of votes in one state. Now he needs the very people he's deriding. He needs John McCain. He needs Jeff Flake. He needs Dean Heller. He needs Mitch McConnell to get his agenda through. He's president now. He's not a candidate. Well, he is president, and he's not running a reality show. And so the audience is one thing, but there are other people on set. There are other mm -hmm. people who's whose powers and roles matter in government. And if you can't build consensus, you can't do anything. Look, I, I was watching this speech, and it reminds me of a guy in a bar complaining about his ex-wife. <laughs> He's so mad at the media, it's like he feels jilted. Yeah. And the problem is that you know, press coverage is his only prism for viewing his own presidency. This guy spends too much time watching TV and reacting to what the media is saying or not saying. There are other tools in the toolbox for presidents that he does not use. Joe? Well, yeah, and, and that's the thing. Gene Robinson, he is so obsessed with the media. Uh, he is so, you know, he's more obsessed with the media than the media is obsessed with himself. And it's, this is a guy who, who's using, you know, Stalinist, uh, you know, terms calling the, the media enemy of the people last night saying the media didn't love their country. This is a guy that sucked up to the New York press corps, to tabloids, New York Times reporters for over four decades. He shamelessly sucked up at all term at all times and played, you know, it played the 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 New York print media so much that he didn't even have women. Like it would, what, what was it, New York Post said best sex ever or something yeah. like that? <laughs> he was obsessed with it yeah. and he played them nonstop and wallowed and would lick their feet if mm -hmm. that's what it was required to good, get a good headline. Now, now suddenly he doesn't like the media. It's his only prism. I, 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 listen, Gene, you can talk about that. You can talk about how horrific uh, this speech was last night uh, for this country, for Washington, for the, the, the state of politics. Or if you want to, we can just talk about the impact of it, which is you, you take that speech and the Mitch McConnell story in the Times this morning. This is a guy that's just not going to get anything done. Yeah, the, the thing about the speech last night was uh, how, how sad it, and, and predictable it was. Because 
what did we expect? And boy, we got it. You know, we, we, it, everyone expected uh, that he would be, it would be an unhinged uh, uh, Donald Trump performance. Um, maybe it was a bit heavier on, uh, on you know, media or enem enemy of the people than, than I might have thought. I didn't know he'd spend so much time on that. It was it, it deeply uh, disturbing and offensive the way he, the way he, he spoke of the media. But what Donald Trump speech is not deeply uh, disturbing and offensive. Um, uh, he, he, he's feuding with with um, Mitch McConnell. Uh, he um, uh, grossly insulted uh, both senators, Republican senators from Arizona. Uh, if, if anything, of course, he made it more difficult for him to get anything done than uh, than easier. And this is this is what we face. We face a presidency. Uh, that is totally dysfunctional and a president who no longer seems interested in getting his agenda passed because if he were he would be listening to to uh, reasonable people in his administration who tell him not to do stuff like this but he continues he continues he either can't help himself or he has decided right. that um, for for whatever reason that his strategy is to continue driving a wedge between yeah. his one-third of the of the population and the rest of the country and that's not a winning strategy right you know, and Mark Halperin, so Gene Robinson, uh, I think really at the end of this block, um, hit what struck me the most about this speech and struck me the most about where Donald Trump is right now. He's not interested. He, he can't be interested in getting things done because anybody who is logically interested in getting things done would have flown to Arizona yesterday and gone and visited John McCain and let's just be cynical that's one vote that he needs would have talked to Jeff Flake hey let's put it behind us how can we work together that's another vote he's gonna need for a lot of things would have called Mitch McConnell again I mean this is not about weakness this is about getting things done. This is doing what Abraham Lincoln did. We, talking to uh, uh, a giant uh, uh, in the United States Senate uh, over the you know uh, uh, over the past thirty years, who said Abraham Lincoln would do whatever it took uh, to, to to get things done. LBJ would do whatever it took. They would go and they would work people. Ronald Reagan, there's a story of Ronald Reagan early in the administration, somebody knocking his famed jelly beans on the floor, and Reagan, the 69-year-old incumbent uh, new president, getting down on his hands and knees and picking up the jelly beans for the congressman, putting them back up, continuing talking every second. Like, what if we're just at a point where he doesn't care if he gets anything done he's just going to divide the country as much as he can because everything he's doing is actually obstructing his own path forward to tax reform to regulatory reform to health care reform to building the wall to doing all the things he wants to do the New York Times story about McConnell and the president is really one of the most important inside game stories of the entire Trump administration because it reflects Mitch McConnell's thinking about being at the end of his rope and not being the least bit invested in the success of Donald Trump anymore. That is a turning point for Capitol Hill and the Republican Party. And the president last night reflects it. He might feel good about that. He always feels good walking to a big arena of cheering people. But he leaves Arizona today in a worse position than he went in. And again, that's not why presidents go on the road. You don't go on the road to make things worse. Right. You go on the road to try to make things better. And he's now made things worse. And, and there's no one in Washington today in the Republican Party, I bet you, who reads that New York Times party <laughs> and thinks, how dare Mitch McConnell do that? Or, well, now Mitch McConnell's going to pay a price because the president's not in a position to punish or discipline or, or get at Mitch McConnell because Mitch McConnell has a lot of power and the president's power is receded. 
Well, you know, Willie, uh, we certainly, there are a lot of people last night that were trying to analyze Donald Trump's mental health. Uh, we won't do that this morning. I won't do that this morning. But I can say he's disconnected, at least from political reality. When he gives the press conference he gave on Tuesday and the business community, uh, uh, the, the political community, everybody was shocked and offended by what he did. And Donald Trump was actually, uh, people inside said he was actually very energized by it was happy all night by his performance it's the same thing last night what he did last night made him feel good and he got on the plane i'm sure he flew home feeling like man i really stuck it to him but he's disconnected from political reality he just hurt himself even more with the Republican Party, with the Senate, with the House, with everybody he needs to pass legislation and move this country forward. Well, he claims to be worried about not getting anything done, but you watch a performance like that last night and you wonder if he even cares about getting anything done. I think to him last night, he put on a show, he aired his grievances, he heard the cheers of the crowd, he got some chants going, he settled scores, he talked about how he watched Good Morning America and saw George Stephanopoulos with Nikki Haley. I mean, he's watching every show, he claims he's not, he's watching the shows and he's analyzing how he's being covered through the media. and that appears to be the only thing that matters to him and when he hears a big crowd like that last night he thinks he had a good night we're just scratching the surface on this raucous divisive trump rally and the chaotic protests that ensued